Let's turn to the book of Prophet Jeremiah. Prophet Jeremiah chapter 31. And read verse 15. Jeremiah 31, 15. Thus said the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rahel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children, because they were not. The voice of a prophet is the voice of God. When a prophet weeps, it means God is weeping. Prophet Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. And if you read the writings of Jeremiah, which we are following these days, you will find that God is actually weeping through the pages of Jeremiah. You can sense, if, you know, as you read the daily reading and read the scripture, you will, if you, the Spirit of God will be giving you the right emotions and you'll be able to sense what God feels. And you can actually feel God weeping as you read the writings of Jeremiah. Truly, God is a weeping God, weeping over His people. Here we read of Rahel, or more so Rachel, and we see that she is weeping. And she is refusing to be comforted. She is weeping for her children, and she does not want comfort. Because her children are dead. We, we are going to see how this verse had three implications in the history of Israel. And how those three implications mean much for us today. I will slowly take you through, so follow carefully. And uh, God is going to speak to us, praise the Lord. Rachel, as we know was the wife of Jacob. Jacob had more than one wife in the Old Testament that was permitted. And Jacob had twelve sons. Rachel was barren for a long time. But finally we see Rachel had two sons. The name of the first son was Joseph. And the name of the second son was Benjamin. Rachel gave birth to the last two sons of Jacob. And she died. When she died she was buried near Bethlehem where Jesus was born. And Ramah. That is found in this verse is about a few miles away from Jerusalem. And that was the town that the Jews often passed through, especially when they went to Babylon on their way to the captivity. Now, Joseph was born and Rachel died in childbirth. When Benjamin was born, Rachel died. We read of that episode in Genesis chapter 35. If you read verse 16 and well 16 to 18. And they journeyed from Bethel and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath and Rachel travailed and she had hard labor and it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her fear not thou shalt have this son also and it came to pass as her soul was in departing for she died that she called his name Benoni but his father called him Benjamin. Rachel had a great concern for her children, the child that was born and the child that was being born. She had a great concern and she sensed that her soul was departing and she was very concerned about the birth of the second child. And the midwife said, don't be afraid Rachel, you will have the son. True to that word, she did have the son, but she also died. 
and she died with a sorrow in her heart she did not have time to think that this child is born before he was born she died but before she died she named him she named him benoni benoni means the son of my sorrow it was in sorrow and in pain she gave birth to him and died but we see jacob the father he was alive and to him it was success it was victory and he named this boy benjamin and um, these two names have meanings benoni means the son of her sorrow benjamin means the son of my right hand rachel called this little boy benoni he's the son of my sorrow and jacob looked at the same boy and said he is the son of my right hand the first name speaks of suffering but the second name speaks of victory indeed we can see the whole thing as a shadow of jesus as benoni the suffering one he speaks of jesus and his whole life of suffering his life was one of suffering all through his life on earth jesus went through so much persecution persecution and persecution and his death also was a very terrible death he died also in suffering yes he was benoni but 3 days later jesus triumphed and rose again and that was victory and that day we see he was benjamin because when jesus rose again what did the father tell him he said sit at my right hand what is the meaning of benjamin you are the son of my right hand so benjamin speaks of victory or the resurrected jesus and benoni speaks of the crucified jesus and rachel named her because the mother will always be burdened when the son suffers that is why for the birth of jesus also we read that mary was told that she would suffer as well if we turn to luke's gospel chapter 2 we read all about the suffering of jesus in this chapter and we also read how a sword would pierce the heart of mary she would also suffer and mary was given this word and we see that through her life we don't speak much about the suffering of mary but probably if you think of her as a normal human being as a normal mother you would really understand how much pain she went through she saw how her son was being targeted by so many of the scribes and the pharisees and the chief priests and where she any mother would like to see the son reach an age where he is responsible takes over a job and is able to uh live on we see her son was cruelly snatched from her hands and he was put on a cross and crucified yes a sword pierced mary's heart also so rachel weeping for her children first of all literally it took place in the life of rachel and uh, spiritually this has a meaning for all of us especially there are so many mothers today who may be very burdened concerning their children so let's just look at that prophecy once again but this time we're going to read it for ourselves when you read rachel put yourself in that place and let's read jeremiah 31:15 again thus said the lord a voice was heard in rama lamentation and bitter weeping Rachel weeping for her children 
refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. There are many mothers, and I would say many fathers too, who are weeping for their children. Why? Because they are not. What is the meaning they are not? Because they are dead. Spiritually, what does death mean? We know the spiritual meaning of death means being cut off from God. A person who is cut off from God is dead. That is why Adam was told, in the day you eat the fruit, you will die. He did not die physically, but he was cut off from God. Death means separation from God. And today, there are many mothers and many fathers who are burdened concerning their children because they are cut off from God, they are dead. And when we see our children in such a state, that brings great sorrow to our hearts. If we are sincere parents, and if we are godly parents, we will want our children also to be godly. And when we see that they do not have the qualities that we want in them, yes, we may scold them, we may correct them, we may shout at them, that's not the point. The point is, are we really burdened? We must carry a burden in our hearts, but I don't mean we get burdened and collapse under the burden, but there must be a burden as parents. We should not be totally uncaring. When we see our children are cut off by the power of sin, cut off by worldliness, when we see our children growing up and instead of following the ways of God, they are following the ways of the world. They want to change their appearance. They want to be like their friends. When we see them becoming beauty conscious, when we see them, you know, growing into another image, and we see that they no longer uh, honor the things of God, they're losing interest in the things of God. The children themselves may not understand. For them, it's an exciting period. They're learning so many things from their friends, and they're getting into mischief. But for parents, it's a burden. Because we can see what is happening. My child is dying. My child is being cut off from God. I brought up this child and now my child is going away from Jesus. That will be a burden. And Rachel refused to be comforted for she found no comfort as long as this child remained dead. How can we be comforted when we see there is no more hope? for our child. Maybe we have even stopped praying. All over the world there are parents who are very burdened. When I went to Switzerland, there were some mothers who came to me and said, I remember one mother, she came and said, please pray, please pray for my daughter. I'm, I'm concerned, I want her to really grow up in the ways of God. And she told me, when, when I see you, I just wish my daughter would also grow up in the right way. So I wondered why she said that. Then she said, you know, when my daughter was a little girl, one mother took her in her arms and blessed her. And she cared for this child so much and gave her food. And, and she went on and then she said, that mother was your mother, brother. I said, really? Yes, when you were a little boy, this happened. And I could just see the burden in her heart for the child, that she wanted the child to grow up and become a woman of God. But when we see those things are not happening, we feel, how can I be happy when I see my child being cut off from God? But let me tell all the parents that there is hope for you, there is hope for your future because there is more to Jeremiah's prophecy I made you read only one verse, but now when we read the next two verses we are going to understand Jeremiah 31 16 and 17 Thus saith the Lord, refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears, 
for thy work shall be rewarded said the Lord and they shall come again from the land of the enemy and there is hope in thine end said the Lord that thy children shall come again to their own border let's hear those words again and I want all parents all parents to hear those words carefully as God is promising Rachel something impossible read it again Thus said the Lord refrain thy voice from weeping and then eyes from tears for thy work shall be rewarded saith the Lord and they shall come again from the land of the enemy and there is hope in thine end saith the Lord that thy children shall come again to their own border What an amazing promise Rachel is say, is weeping for her children because they are dead but God is saying they will come again What an amazing promise and it is only the living God who can make such a promise to us Parents loved ones we may be burdened concerning our family it may not be your child it may be your sister or it may be your brother it may be a parent or a grandparent it could be a distant cousin it could be anyone you are burdened about and you carrying that burden in your heart and you're weeping like Rachel refusing to be comforted because that person is cut off from God we are so many parents are willing to shed tears when the child fails an exam or doesn't get the particular posting in in school or something we are so concerned but real spiritual parents will be more concerned for the souls of their children it doesn't matter whether my child is educated in one of the world's most prestigious universities it doesn't matter whether my child is perfectly healthy or not it doesn't matter if my child is most beautiful or not those are not the things that matter i want my child to know jesus i want my child to hear the voice of jesus i want my child one day this child will be out of my hands and i want this child to grow up in the ways of god that will be the burden of a spiritual parent and when such a spiritual parent looks upon the child and sees that the child is spiritually dead and that the prayer and the tears of this parent are not wiped away and the prayers are not heard naturally this parent will be burdened and refuse to be comforted but the lord says don't be refrain your voice from weeping because your child will come again because i will do it i will bring them back and god has made that promise praise god for that glorious promise which only our god can make no man can make no man can comfort us but we have a god the living god who's able to inspire life into our dead children therefore shall we praise god hallelujah 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 oh my god i praise you my lord i praise you my jesus i praise you my jesus praise the lord 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 praise you praise you praise you praise you there is hope in another translation says there is hope for your future says the lord your children will come again to their own land therefore let us cling to that promise there is hope where we feel there is no hope god is saying there is hope the second way that we can look at this whole verse pertaining to the israelites we see it speaks of the whole body of israel rachel is um, often depicted by the israelites as the mother of the nation israel therefore from jeremiah 31:15 when we read that verse again we're going to understand it in a new way rachel is now depicted as the mother of the whole nation and what is she weeping for let's read that verse again now Thus saith the Lord a voice was heard in Rama lamentation and bitter weeping Rachel weeping for her children refused to be comforted for her children because they were not Why is Rachel weeping or why is she weeping for the nation Why what has happened to the nation Yes 
Rachel was the mother of Benjamin and Joseph, and, and we know that Joseph had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Benjamin was one of the tribes, and Ephraim was the head of the ten tribes. In other words, the tribes actually descended from Rachel. That is why she's called the mother of the nation. And the reason she is weeping is because they have been taken away into captivity. So that speaks of the, the burden for the whole nation, not just one little story in the Old Testament. Now, spiritually also, this has an implication for us. When, that, when I say for us, I mean the church. When we consider the church, we know that the church is also a mother. When we turn to Galatians, we read how the church has been compared to a mother in chapter 4, verse 26. But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. Jerusalem which is above. Why is she said to be above? Because John sees her as a woman standing on the moon. And we see she is in heavenly places. When we receive the Holy Spirit, what happens? St. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, when we receive the Holy Spirit, what happens? We go up into heavenly places. All those who have received the Holy Spirit, where are you? You are in heavenly places. And all those who have received the Holy Spirit together, whom do they constitute? The New Testament church. All those who have received the Holy Spirit. Not only in our church, not only UPC. Anybody who has received the Holy Spirit comes into the New Testament church and we see together that the whole body of spirit baptized believers forms the New Testament church. This is Jerusalem which is above, which is the mother of us all. Now, here we see Rachel is the mother of the nation. Com we are comparing Rachel to the church. And yes, we are all Rachel. And uh, we see we have Joseph and Benjamin, two children in the church. Joseph can speak of the elder child or the older believers. And Benjamin was just born as Rachel died. And Benjamin can speak of the new souls whom God brings into the church. Two groups of people, believers and new souls. When we look at a believer's list, we have two sets of names. One, those who are communicant members, who are believers, established believers of the church. And then there are souls who are non-communicant. There are new souls who are yet to come in. Maybe they are just entering in. Spying the land, looking around, it's all new for them. They don't know uh, whether to join the church or probably they may not be saved. But they are, do, they are coming for the meeting. Now, when we as a church have the heart of Rachel, we will be weeping for our children. We will be weeping for the newborn child. We will be weeping for the new souls. An ideal believer, a good believer is one who shares the burden of God and the servants of God in caring for new believers. Sometimes new people walk in. I have mentioned this before. New people walk into our church. And probably the first time they have stepped in. And everything is new. You know, some of us have been attending this church for three years, four years. You don't know the psychology. I know it because I go to new churches all the time. And I know the feeling when you go into a new place. For us, it's the old place. You close your eyes and you fall asleep. You can dream. You know this is a crooked hall. You know the colors here. You know everything about this place. You're used to the people. Then we start relaxing and feel comforted. A person who walks in for the first time, it's so scary, it's all new, and they feel so distant. And when the meeting is over, what do we see? Joseph and Joseph will be chatting, having a good time, and poor little Benoni stuck in a corner with no one to care for. That is not how it would be. 
When a new person comes into the church, they must feel welcome. They must feel, gosh, they are, they are like they know me for so many years. They love me, they care for me. They must feel that warmth. And this is not something that we must do because, uh, well, I have to do it. It is part of, you know, the church rules and the preachers then and brother will watch from there and if I don't talk, you know, I'm saying this because after this meeting you're going to see Joseph and Joseph will not be together. All are going to go to Benoni and say, Benoni, how are you? And they'll do that once and that's the end. Now that's an emotional reaction. That's an emotional reaction. But when it comes from the heart, when you realize uh, it comes from the heart, you won't need a reminder. Your heart will love the new person. I haven't seen you here before. Is it the first time you're coming? Oh, you're welcome here. And we'll be so happy. Alright, so just for today, I'd like to give a warm welcome to anybody who is here for the first time. Anyone here who is for the first time, please lift up your hand. Yes. So we all welcome you in Jesus' name. We are so happy to have you here today. And uh, remember, after the meeting, all the believers will come and meet you and they will continue to extend their warm welcome. Now, the reason they are laughing is because, you know, you know what happens in a family? There are some families here where they have only one child. And the emotional psychology in a family drastically changes when a second child is born. If you don't believe it, go and ask the first child. The first child in a family always feels, you know, I have lost all that love and attention and care and my parents, they seem to have like, they forgot that I am their child. And all the attention is given to the second child. So sometimes we can feel like that. Believers also can feel in, a, in any church when a new soul comes in. A new soul has to be cared for. It's a newborn baby, not a football. A newborn baby has to be cared for. The limbs are tender. We to hold gently. Everything has to be gentle. And we need to care for, more for. And then some, I know, I know some believers have actually told me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now you've forgotten us. Now you only care for the new souls. And I thought, come on, this is a typical family, isn't it? You're acting just like the elder sibling. Rather, what should you do? I remember one family where there were five children and I, I don't think there's anyone here like that. So the first child, she is about five or six or something like that. And they are there, you know, one after the other. And I asked the mother, how do you manage? She said, she helps me. So I observed and I found this five-year-old girl, girl is not like five-year-old girl. For us it's other, other ways. And sometimes we can be 15 and we'll behave like five. But this five-year-old girl was like 20. She had such maturity, she would be looking after the children, making sure they are fed. And when a child wants to go to the toilet, she'll say, mommy, you sit here, I will take and she would take the child, bring her back. And she was sitting in the meeting and suddenly there was another believer. She was struggling with her child. This five-year-old girl went up and said, May I help you? I was fascinated by that. And so I asked the mother, she said, Well, she helps me washing up. She helps in, in washing the clothes. She knows how to put the clothes in the washing machine. She knows how to bring it out. She knows everything. That sense of care and responsibility has come into her. It's marvelous for a child. But how beautiful if as believers we can also take that burden. Therefore, don't leave everything to the servants of God and say, that's their job. Now, therefore, I don't mean now you go and start your little uh, altar call in a corner and say, okay, no, brother was saying something. So believers, anyone who need any burden, come here. Okay, now kneel down. I'm going to pray for you. Now don't start that. Okay. That's, that's taking it to the other extreme. What you need to do is show your love. You don't have to go and open the Bible and say, okay, I'll give you a Bible study. You don't need to do that. What they need is your love. They need your care. That is what they need. 
and when we know of new souls there are so many new souls who suffer they they brought so many problems sometimes people step into a church on a sunday not because they've got nowhere else to go but because they got so many problems in their hearts they've got burdens they need to unburden themselves and when they come sharing these burdens they want someone who can listen to them so you be there for them and as they talk to you listen and you assure them i will pray for you and you could even make contact with them talk to them and say i am praying for you and that love is what they need so many people are needing just that kind word from your lips if only you could understand and be like rachel yes we can also share the burden of so many new souls who are being added to the church yes here also in ireland so many souls keep coming here every day every sunday we see souls being added to the church and so we must as elder siblings take that burden and pray for them and until we see them established in our midst we must continue keeping that sorrow in our heart to pray for them how beautiful when you see a new person actually we have so many miscarriages spiritually we see souls coming in they come to our church for one week sometimes for one month and then sometimes six months they attend and suddenly they go missing then for two months they are missing then they turn up again then another two months they are missing then they turn up again and you can see that something is not steady in their lives and and they are not being established they are not able to make a right decision they are wandering from place to place a, a, a christian who wanders from church to church will never grow we are called the plants of god and what do you know about a plant once you plant it the next day you think okay that's not good enough let me put it in my bedroom and you put it there in your bedroom and i think there's not enough light let me put it in the kitchen so you put it there oh no too much smell here so you take it and put it in the living room oh no it's too bright here let me take it. what happens to such a plant if it is taken out of the soil all the time moved around that plant will die it has to be planted and the root must go down it has to start feeding a soul who wanders from church to church like a spiritual bedouin like a nomad wandering in the wilderness with no definite place to stay will not grow it's good to find a place and stay there and grow so when souls come and they go away it is very sad we must take that burden in our hearts but how beautiful when a new soul comes attends the meetings hears the truth and makes a decision commits one's life and is established accepts and then takes water baptism takes holy communion receives the holy spirit established as a believer praise god that is the children there is hope your children will come again so let's take that burden we have souls who are in the process of being formed souls who are attending the church but they're not making a decision for their future let's take that burden into our hearts let us pray for them now we're going to look at it in the third angle jeremiah 31:15 we're going to look at it as a prophecy and this prophecy is fulfilled in the new testament if we turn to matthew's gospel chapter 2 and read from 16 to 18 there you see the prophecy mentioned and its fulfillment then herod when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in bethlehem and in all the coast thereof from 2 years old and under according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men then was fulfilled that which was spoken by jeremiah the prophet saying in rama was there a voice heard lamentation and weeping and great mourning rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not we see here herod when he heard that a king of the jews was going to be formed he planned a, a carnage a, a massacre of all the children and he did not know that it was satan himself who was inspiring this diabolic plan and 
Brother Victor, did you know that Herod's plan was all concerning you? Did you ever, ever, ever connect that? Did you ever think? Herod made a plan. I'm going to have a carnage. I'm going to have a massacre. I'm going to kill. But he never knew that behind that plan was Satan. And you were in that plan. Did you know that? Has anyone told you? Okay, I'm going to tell you. You know what? When he planned to kill Jesus because he didn't want this king to arise and become a threat to his kingdom. That was Herod. But the plan was much deeper. You know what Satan wanted to do? He wanted not just to destroy a coming king, but he wanted to destroy Brother Victor's savior and send you to hell. If Jesus could be killed then as a child, it's over. It's finished. Your savior is dead and you will be going to hell. So you can see the big plan of Herod was actually far bigger. It was the plan of the devil. Now it's not just Brother Victor, it's all of you. Satan wanted to kill your savior by killing all these children. Now the killing of children somehow seemed to be part of Satan's plan for God's people. You see it happening even in the Old Testament, a similar event in the time of Moses in order to kill the leader of the Israelites. We see all male children, two years and younger, were slaughtered. They were all killed. And uh, thank God Moses was saved that day. How was Moses saved? We heard one day it was because of the faith of his parents. The faith of his parents, you know, although Pharaoh passed certain laws, his parents by faith refused to submit to those laws and said, I will not subject my child to this worldly law. Probably the law of Ireland will come out. And all children must dress like this. Or all children must go and worship an image. Or all children must deny Jesus. You must be in a secular school. You must also be secular. You must not be a religious person. And when it comes to that, maybe only then your children will have good education. And you have a choice to make between Jesus and education. What would you choose? So many times we are faced with a choice and that is when we are tested. Our priorities will be tested and we must be very careful that the soul of our children must be preserved. See, see Moses' parents had a faith concerning Moses. They said, this is God's child. And God has a purpose concerning this child. And therefore, we're going to surrender this child to God. And the faith of his parents saved him. And in the end, you see, Moses grew up with that same faith. Their faith took away the fear concerning the king. And we see the same quality in Moses. Now, Herod was doing the same thing. He was trying to kill Jesus in this massacre and by killing him, he was trying to kill our Savior. Now that is how it was for is the Israelites. But now we are going to look at it spiritually. As we have been looking to the two earlier prophecies, we, the, the, the two earlier interpretations. First of all, we saw how Rachel is weeping for Benoni or uh, the child. And we saw how it speaks of uh, parents in this church burdened concerning your children or if you extend that analogy, you can find that it's applied to anybody who's burdened for anyone. You can be burdened for any loved one, any friend. And God has made a promise in Jeremiah 31, 17. He will bring them back. We can also see in the second interpretation how Rachel is the mother of the nation and she is burdened for the nation. And spiritually we see we as a church must be burdened for the new souls who come to our church. And we must care for them. We must love them. Now I repeated that because already some of you forgot. That after the meeting you should be speaking to new souls. And by the time I finish the next part. Probably you would forget. So please don't forget. Let it be in your heart. Have a mother's heart. And care for the souls who come to church. But now we are going to look at the most important interpretation. We saw how 
this prophecy took place in the New Testament where Herod was trying to kill Jesus and at that time we see Matthew quoting the prophecy of Jeremiah and saying through this incident we see the prophecy of Jeremiah being fulfilled. What does this speak of spiritually? Herod spiritually speaks of the devil. He is the, the, the devil is called the prince of this world or the king of this world. And uh, he is the ruler of this world. He is the one who passes laws in this world that try to destroy us. And we are Rachel and the child that God is giving us speaks of the man child. Now we know of that incident in Revelation 12 of the man child. If you can go to that, you, I, I believe I have shared this with you already. Can you read Revelation chapter 12 verse 3 and verse 4. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. I'm going to test your memory to see if you remember. We see... Um, a big scene in heaven. A woman standing on the moon and a huge red dragon with seven heads waiting to... Well, just waiting there actually, just waiting there. And this scene is what John sees in heaven. The woman is the church. The man-child we know is the group of people who will be caught up when Jesus comes. And here the devil is waiting for the child to be born so that he can devour the child as soon as the child is born. When the child is born, what happens? The child is caught up to the throne of God. That is the coming of Jesus. But what is the dragon doing? He is waiting to devour the child as soon as the child is born. How does, what does that mean spiritually? Does it mean that as soon as the trumpet sounds and the church is being caught up, the dragon will come and try to prevent the church from being caught up? So what does it mean then? Spiritually, we must understand the meaning of this verse. Some of us may be thinking that battle is going to take place up in the air and the dragon is going to eat the child as soon as it is born. No. Spiritually, this man-child speaks of our overcoming life, our victory. And we, that is why we go from victory to victory, from strength to strength in our spiritual life. There are many areas in your life where you may be defeated. You take a burden for that area. We heard in the testimony today, sister was saying how she was concerned about one particular area of her life. And it was a burden. She was struggling to surrender. She was afraid what would happen if she made that surrender. But, and there was a big battle, big battle, big battle within her. In the end, the Lord triumphed. And she got a victory. The moment she got the victory, what did she experience, she said? Joy. A joy that she can't explain. Now, that is the birth of the man -child. What does the Bible say? When a woman gives birth to a child, what does she experience? She experiences joy. She forgets all her pain. She experiences joy. So the moment God gives you victory in a particular area, the joy that fills your heart is unspeakable. I have experienced these joys so many times in different areas and I got so many more areas where I'm waiting to experience that joy. But... Every time that joy comes into your heart and, and you know that God has given you a victory, what do you know? I just had a man-child. How many of you have experienced victory in some area of your personal life? Put up your hand.
What about the rest? You haven't experienced any victory in your personal life? So in other words, you have never tasted the joy. So you can see you're, you're really staying away from the truth. You're not experiencing victory. You may have a problem in your personal life and you are you know that this you have to overcome. I can't be like this. It may be a fit of anger or it could be some bitterness against a person, a memory that you're trying to forget or it's a habit that you're trying to overcome, a sin that is a struggle or it may be a sickness in your body. It could be a situation in the family and it's a struggle, there's a situation and it's causing pain in your heart and you want to overcome. And there's a struggle, there's a struggle. What is that? That is the labor, the pain. There are tears involved. Rachel weeping for the child. But when the child is born, you get victory. What a beautiful joy. Oh, I have got victory. You will be able to thank God. Your heart is broken. It's humbled. It jumps. It rejoices. And you, sometimes you just go crazy. You don't know what to do. It's a God. And that's just one child. Just imagine when you get the ultimate victory and you are caught up. What a glorious day that will be. Now, let me see another uh, show of hands. But this time I'm going to change the question. How many of you got victory in an area and then lost that victory? Put up here. Praise the Lord. Yes, there are a few hands. That is so true, practically. You get a victory and you're so happy, you're, you're enjoying that victory and the victory doesn't last. What happened? That is what John sees. As soon as the child is born, the dragon wants to devour the child. What is this child really? It is our overcoming life. You have got victory in a particular area. Maybe it's a particular habit. Maybe you like certain worldly songs and you're a slave to these songs and you're struggling. You sing them in your dreams. And I used to remember uh, there was a time when I used to listen to all these worldly songs and I gave them up. And then what happened? Every time I went to the hairdressers I would hear those songs. And oh, I don't know what to do. I, I, if I sit like this at the hairdressers, and they're going to think that this guy is crazy. So I used to try to keep myself occupied and all that. After a while I found there's no need to actually put my finger in. I overcame the need. You know why? Because I started enjoying the songs. What happened? Sitting next to me at the hairdressers was the dragon with seven heads. And he had arranged for that situation to devour the child. Dear children of God, this is what happens. When you have the child, be careful. Humble yourself. Don't think, that's it, now I had the child over. No, the dragon wants to devour the child as soon as the child is born. We get our victory in stages. One man child, the next man child, victory after victory. But even though you get your victory, be careful. If you are an alcoholic and God delivered you from your bondage to alcohol, even though you have been delivered, you must still keep your life of separation. You may say, I used to be really bound to the bottle. But now that I've been freed from the bottle, now I don't have to be careful anymore. I can even walk into a pub and I can enjoy real victory. I can enjoy peace. Why? Because I've been delivered. And then you have these magazines and it has this huge Jack Daniels there. And what do you do? You say, well, I used to have that and now it's all gone. And so I'm, not in, I'm not attached to it. And so it's okay is there. What you don't know is, it's not going to be like that if you're careless. Even though you make a decision, and you, even though you've overcome, you have to make a decision. 
a decision to keep that separation. Never consider yourself to be strong. Always consider you are vulnerable. Why? Because that victory is only a baby. It's only a little, tiny, tender, gentle baby. And that baby must be preserved. Until that baby grows and becomes a man. That is what St. Paul says. We are not to be just babes in Christ. We have to become a perfect man. Until then we have to care for that baby and look after the baby. But we see there is an enemy who wants your baby. There is an enemy who wants to destroy the victorious life that God gives you. So we must, even now, like Rachel, we must not wait. And probably some of you are weeping because you lost your child. But let me tell you, if you have lost some area of your life, a failure has come. You enjoyed that victory for a while. In your personal life, you overcame. Some of you may be in the area of bitterness. And uh, you were angry with a person or bitter with a person. And you, you kept that in your heart. And God took it away and gave you a child. Now you are free. Hallelujah, I am free. But everybody is not free. Now somebody else comes and talks about that person to you. And you think, it's okay, I am free now, I can listen. What happens? That bitterness is formed again. And you lose your child. You lose that victory. If there is anyone here who has lost your victory, you are Rachel, weeping for the dead child. But the promise of God is, refrain thy voice from weeping. I will give you your child back. That is the promise we must hold on to. The dragon is waiting to devour the child. The enemy wants to destroy you. Not you, not you, but your child. Has the devil ever tried to stop you from coming for meetings? Now those were the days 20 years ago. But the devil is updated now. Upgraded. He is no longer going to stop you from coming for the meeting. In fact, he will give you a car and say, please go. But give me your child. He does not want the woman, he wants the child. He does not want to stop you from being a member of the Universal Pentecostal Church. He wants your victory. He wants the man-child. He wants to destroy what God is giving you. Therefore, if you have a, a victory in your life, preserve it. If you have lost that victory, weep like Rachel. And the Lord will give you a promise saying, Don't weep anymore. Your tears have been wiped away. And I am going to bring your child back. Let us all therefore take that burden concerning our spiritual lives. We want that victory. We want that overcoming. We want to be overcomers. We want to become that man-child. On that day we see a man-child is caught up. Who is that man-child? That's the bride of Jesus who has overcome in every area. In every area we have become overcomers. Jesus is coming for the man-child. Yes, he is coming for you. When the day he comes, let us not be found as people who have not overcome. Because that is what the tribulation martyrs are. They may have overcome in certain areas, but they did not overcome in every area. May God lead us in this path of victory. Let us continue to hope. Yes, at this moment, there may be sorrow in our hearts, but our God has made a promise, you will have your child back. Shall we stand?